Hello and welcome back to the Scarab Solutions Ancient Art Podcast. In our last episode on the Art Institute of Chicago's Corinthian Pyxis, we saw how the early archaic Greeks of the Orientalizing period incorporate stylistic elements and ideas from their Near Eastern neighbors, and also from their own Bronze Age ancestors. We looked at the emergence of monumental Greek temple architecture with its unprecedented, massively impressive pedimental sculpture, and ultimately we came to understand how the Greeks paid homage to their Mycenaean Bronze Age ancestors by employing scenes of ferocious beasts and fiendish monsters on these early temple pediments. They did this as a means of confronting the viewer, engaging with them and conditioning their psyche for approaching the divine, just as the Mycenaeans did half a millennium earlier at the entrance to the great city of Mycenae. And on a far more diminutive, personal scale, we see the same confrontational conditioning effect employed on the funerary vessels of this early archaic period in ancient Greece as a sort of memento mori, a reminder of our ultimate fate. In this episode, I want us to take a look at a significantly later example of Greek pottery and vase painting, also at the Art Institute of Chicago. This is an Attic white groundware Lakethos from around 450 to 440 BC attributed to the Achilles painter. Okay, what does all that mean? Well, you often come across the term Attic on gallery labels, and that's got nothing to do with where you keep your Christmas lights. Attic means it's from Attica, which is the region of Greece that surrounds Athens. Aha! Uh-huh. Moving along now. White groundware? You see, you got your black figure vase painting and your red figure vase painting, and then you got your white groundware because the figures are on a white background, and ware is just the fancy word for ceramics. You know, like dinnerware. And finally, a lakithos is a specific type of ancient Greek pottery vessel usually in a tall, slender, vase-like shape with a tight spout and handle, but you come across small, more squat versions, too. The Lakethos was specifically used as a decanter for oil, mostly olive oil for ancient Greek athletes. Now, the Greeks lived in a time before the invention of soap. Filthy buggers? Not really. See, olive oil is an exceptionally good cleaning agent, not to mention a common ingredient in some exotic, old-fashioned soaps. After a long day of rolling around with your classmates naked in the sand at the gymnasium, Greek athletes would rub olive oil on their lean, tight flesh. They'd then take a small curved metal tool called a strigil and scrape it along their skin, removing the oil and all the grime, sweat, and guck. Don't believe me? Next time you take off a day-old band-aid and it leaves behind that yucky glue residue, Rub a little olive oil over it for a few seconds, and presto, ancient goo be gone. This does not necessarily constitute an endorsement, neither expressed nor implied, of the aforementioned products, Band-Aid brand bandages, and goo be gone, or any similar or related product on the part of the author and his affiliates. Use at your own risk, do not attempt at home, yada yada, etc., etc. Before we dive headlong into the subject matter of this lakithos, I want to explain why the painted surface is not nearly in as good condition as most of the black and red figure vases you'll spot at the Art Institute. You see, in the white ground technique, the white background was painted onto the surface after it had been fired, and then the figures were painted on top of that. All the decoration of black or red figure vases was applied before the firing process as slip, not actually paint, and then fired, so baking the decoration onto the surface, so it ain't going nowhere. Paint applied to the surface after firing, however, isn't as durable and it's prone to flaking over the eons. The scene decorating this lakithos depicts a gray-haired elderly man with a long red cloak leaning on a cane. He looks forward into the eyes of a youthful, mostly nude male figure with a shield strapped to his back and holding a spear. The fact that the youth is nude indicates his function as a warrior, and the shield and spear kind of help us draw that conclusion too. Warriors in ancient Greece, of course, didn't march out onto the battlefield in the nude. Not unless they had a few too many at the feast the night before. No, they were fully armored with a sturdy breastplate, greaves on the legs, and a helmet. 
Excavations in the latter part of the 20th century at Midia, near Mycenae, actually unearthed a magnificent Bronze Age Mycenaean cuirass, or a breastplate, from the 15th century BC, the time of the great heroic warriors whose legacy inspired the later epics, now in the Archaeological Museum of Nauplion in Greece. Check out the website, scarabsolutions.com, for a link to an image and a description of the armor and the excavations at Midia. There's also an interesting article in the, the March-April 2007 issue of Biblical Archaeology Review called Historic Homer, Did It Happen?, which talks about this breastplate and other Mycenaean period historical accuracies in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Despite the obvious use of armor, however, Greek artists imagined their mythological heroes were, in fact, nude. Throughout ancient Greek vase painting, we encounter the nude warrior, be it Hercules, Achilles, Hector, or any other heroic mythic warrior. Many a Greek male was fond of casting himself in the light of the mythic warrior, particularly upon death through the use of the nude male Kouros statue as a headstone. The Kouros is the earliest form of freestanding monumental Greek sculpture in the round which finds its origin around the time of the Orientalizing period, which we covered last time when we looked at the Pyxis. Perhaps a similar sort of desired effect is being attempted here, to cast the deceased in the light of the heroic warriors of yore. Remember, just about all the ancient Greek faces you encounter in museum collections were actually grave goods. One might be inclined to interpret this scene depicted here as a father figure bidding farewell to the youth, their final goodbye before the youth marches off to battle perhaps the last time they'll ever see each other, alive at least. And neither figure has an expression of overwhelming emotion. They both bear a sober countenance, not betraying their torn spirits within. Think about the difference in the way I'm describing the subject matter of this vase painting compared to the Corinthian Pyxis from a century earlier. We're trying to get inside the heads of the figures represented on the Lakithos. We're looking at a scene from some dreamt-up story, there's definitely some sort of context here, in contrast to the decoration on the Pyxis, where the creatures are outside of any context, any narrative or story. This is a big change taking place in the late 6th, early 5th century Greek vase painting, a movement away from representations of ferocious confrontational beasts toward narrative scenes. Sure, representations of the Homeric epics go way back, but the narrative becomes firmly entrenched only in the mid to late archaic period, pushing aside the decorative flower patterns and the prominence of confrontational beasts common to the Orientalizing period.